Welcome back to Survey of Engineering. Today we're going to be uh, covering some simple truss analysis in civil engineering. So what's in this video? We're going to talk about what compression is or tension and the forces that are felt in beams. We're also going to do some simple truss analysis using the method of joints. To do that, we'll talk about what statistical determinacy is. We'll use free body diagrams and use force balance equations to solve for our unknown forces. <coughs> Your portfolio questions for this video are, what are the assumptions made when solving for simple trusses? List the steps required to solve for forces in the members of si simple trusses. And what is the difference between compression and tension? So a truss, allows strong structures to be made with minimal materials and really this came about with the advent of steel so that we had strong but relatively lightweight um, beams that could be made long. <coughs> They're made, trusses are made by connecting several beams together in a very strategic way and we're going to talk about um, how that's done or why that's done. To do truss analysis, we simplify things by making some assumptions. Um, we need to do this to make calculations easier. So the first assumption that we make is that the truss members have a negligible or a very small mass compared to the load that they're carrying. This means that we don't have to worry about their mass when we're doing our calculations. Second, we assume that the members are connected at joints that pivot. So these points where they're connected can freely move like a joint would. We assume that one support point is connected to um, the ground or something that is really large and immovable. You think of this as like a big cement wall or the ground. So the other support we show as being supported on rollers. This just means that it's supporting it in the vertical direction or there's a normal force um, pointing toward the truss but not a horizontal force because it can it's free to move horizontally at that point. So the results of the assumptions that we've made are that we can uh, talk about the, that the beam we know is either going to be in compression or tension. And that means that it's either going to be squeezed, which is compression, or it's going to be pulled apart, which is tension. So squeezing force, it squishes together pulling apart force is tension. So compression and tension. Um, whatever is pushing on the beam senses force in the opposite direction. The beam does not want to be squeezed so it reacts and it pushes back on um, its connection. Same thing with tension. It, the beam doesn't want to be pulled so it resists by pulling back. In the um, simple calculations, the simple truss assumptions, we assume that there's no deformation, which means that the beam is not really changing shape. Um, it feels a, fr a force, a stretch or a squish force, but that doesn't change its shape enough for us to care about it. Another result of our assumptions is we're going, or another assumption that we're going to make is we're going to neglect the forces caused by gravity that are associated with the beams themselves. The only forces that we're going to worry about are the external forces on the beam um, and not the force of gravity because of the beams themselves. So this means that um, 
in addition to our joint assumption, our free joint assumption, that we have no bending or something called a moment, which means the, the bending force or uh, rotational force in the beams. So we can assume that the forces are along the axis of the beams only. Okay, so in our simple truss analysis, really what we're talking about is the field of statics, which is calculations of forces that are inside systems that aren't moving. So things that are sitting still and, and things are not changing inside that, that system. Um, the basis of how we're going to do our analysis is the physics equation that is one of Newton's laws, Newton's second law, that says that the total force in a system is equal to its mass times its acceleration. So if we know that our system is not moving, then we also know that the acceleration has to be zero. In the system that we have in this picture with the object sitting on a table or something, um, we know it's not moving and so our total forces have to equal zero. Total force is the gravitational force of the object, so its weight sitting on the table, but the there's also a normal force of the table pushing back up on the object. And we know that those two forces have to sum to equal zero. That means that they are equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. So force of gravity is equal to minus the force, the normal force. So just to recap, the table is pushing up on the object with an equal but an opposite. So here are our rules for truss analysis that are a result of our assumptions that we've talked about. The forces at each pin have to be balanced. This means that the sum of the forces in the x direction have to equal zero and the sum of the forces in the y direction have to equal zero. The little sigma sign that means that we are adding up all of those x forces and we're adding up all of the y forces and each of those sums have to equal zero. Now you could have forces that are pointing in maybe not a horizontal or a vertical direction. Those are force vectors and they can always be broken up into an x component and a y component that when you add those vectors together you get the resultant force. So um, we know that also the beams transmit forces along their length. That means that there are only axial forces along the axis of the beams. And that a force in a truss member could be either compression, a squeezing force, or tension, a pulling apart force. There's no twisting or rotational forces or shear forces in the truss members. The rigid mounts can react in both an X and a Y, a horizontal and a vertical direction. And the rolling mounts react only in a uh, direction that's perpendic perpendicular to the ground or the wall and that's free to ra react or free to move in the other direction. So let's um, do an example and consider this simple truss where we have a force acting at point A pushing toward the left of 100 newtons. The measurements you can see on our members are written in black. The legs of the triangle are one meter each and the hypotenuse of the triangle is um, square root of two meters. This is because it is a 45, 45, 90 degree triangle. So common convention, and that's something that we're going to stick with here, is that we're going to call up the positive y direction, and we're going to call right the positive x direction. 
Deciding on the coordinate system helps us with the bookkeeping of signs and directions of all the forces. So any forces pointing up or to the right, we're going to call positive. So the first thing that we need to do is draw the external reaction forces. These are the forces that are acting at our connection points to the supports of the truss. That's at points B and C. So we have a normal force at point B. We're going to call that F sub BY. And we have a normal force at C. We're going to call that FCY. And also at B, because it's a rigid mount, we can have a horizontal force. We'll call that FBX. However, since there's no, since point C is on rollers, there's no horizontal fo force at that point. Now, at this point, we don't necessarily know for sure what the direction of these forces are. So we'll assume this, and as we work through the math, our signs, if we're very careful, will tell us if we've made the correct assumption or not. So before we start to solve the problem, we have to decide if we have enough information in our truss <laughs> to be able to solve it. That when we have enough information, we call the truss statically determinate. So to solve a problem with more than one unknown, more, thi more than one thing that we don't know, and here we've got three reaction forces that we don't know, plus any internal forces, we don't know those either, so <coughs> we have several unknowns. So we're going to have, a s uh, have to have a system of equations to solve those. Um, so we have to, in order to for it to be solvable, we have to have the number of equations equal the number of unknowns. Known the way we figure that out is um, we can write a force equation, a force balance equation, two of them, one in the x direction and one in the y direction for each of the number of joints. So we can write two times the number of joints equations. And the number of unknowns we have, we count them up, it's the number of reaction forces that we've drawn, those are unknowns, and then any of the internal forces in, in each of the beams. So our unknowns are the number of beams plus the number of reaction forces. Now, so for this example, we can see that number of equations is 2 times 3 joints, which is 6, and the number of unknowns is 3 beams plus 3 reaction forces, which is 6. So our question whether our equations equal our unknowns is answered. Yep, they're equal. So we have a statistically determinate system, and we can go ahead and solve. So to make it easier to solve, it's always helpful to draw a diagram so we can see what's going on. And we want to remove any parts of the picture that are not important. So we're going to draw what's called a free body diagram, and we'll remove the supports from this picture because we don't we know they're there, and we've added the forces in. So we're only going to include the forces that those supports um, cause on our joints. We call it a free body diagram because now that we don't show that it's connected to the ground anywhere, it looks just sort of like a, a free picture, free object floating in space but we've um, recorded all the relevant forces.